Well, good morning, everybody. First of all, just a quick announcement here. I, I had, my old server did have to shut down over the weekend, and so I had this new one that I've been working on for the last couple of months. I tried to build the front end of it for it over the weekend, excuse me, and uh, I, it's a disaster. I don't like it at all. I got to keep working on this. I'll work on it this week. So I know a lot of you use this site. Um, I apologize for this short time period where it's kind of a mess, but we'll get it fixed and get it up and functioning and get all of the uh, other resources back online and working for you. So um, again, we'll get it fixed, but uh, right now you're more than welcome to go play around with it, but it's a clunky mess. So that was a bit distracting over the weekend. Spent, I don't know, about 40 hours this weekend trying to get that thing done. And I feel like I'm disconnected from the weather pattern. So let's kind of walk through this together today. This was yesterday's satellite imagery. And the heavy rainfall and the cloud cover keeping things cool and wet in parts of Texas. You know, this was breaking a long-standing drought situation that had been developing here in the Southern Plains. But not everybody was able to get rain out of this. I paused the image right here just because the smoke that's across parts of the upper Midwest and north and plains getting the southern canadian prairie and i just found it fascinating this like i don't know this tendril of smoke that was pulled right into the flow uh you know right in through this particular part of the upper atmosphere and at the surface underneath this so the upper level flow was coming around like this but at the surface there's a high pressure cell sitting here and that's because there's upper level convergence causing the air to sink over the top of this. So if you can kind of see this in three dimensions, as the air sinks, it's going down in this area. So we'll go ahead and put an arrow, meaning going into the image. And when that air hits the surface, it has to come out and it turns to the right, which is like this. So that's a turn to the right. So you have compression and sinking aloft in the jet stream. The air sinks where the X is, it hits the ground, and then because of the Coriolis effect turns in this direction. And last night it got pretty chilly under some of this area. Uh, in fact, we were concerned about some patchy frost far in upstate New York and then back into parts of like Ontario and Quebec uh, just yesterday. Uh, but thinking this through uh, this morning, you can see early here, we do have the frost advisories that are out for Pennsylvania to New York, parts of, uh, of Vermont as well. Now on the, you know, back farther to the west, there's red flag warnings, there's heat, excessive heat watches, warnings, advisories in the west, wind issues in the west still. And you can even see the flood watch. It's now for this part of Texas after going weeks with no precipitation. But coming back to this region here, just before sunrise, I did pull up uh, the surface observations. So the winds were very, very weak, as you can see. So you're not going to be able to see that full circulation I just mentioned there. But maybe you can a little bit. See how these winds are going in this direction. You know, these winds up here, now well, they're just too weak to really show you this. But um, you can see that several of these locations had, you know, uh, clear skies and light winds. And some of the temperatures here did get down pretty close uh, into the low 30s. But it's in these interior regions that it likely happened where we don't have weather stations. So just wanted to point that out for you. Uh, back to the west where things are getting very hot again. I just wanted to show you the wildfire activity. It was quite difficult to see. So you can see some of the smoke here in Nevada. You can see some of the smoke in Oregon. But there were very large clouds. I mean, huge storms nearby producing a lot of lightning yesterday. And it was only when the sun set that you can see the heat signatures in the infrared. See those little black dots? That There's one here, there. You can see them all over the place. These are the fires as viewed in infrared, and that's one of our big concerns going forward because that smoke over the next 48 hours is going to continue to spread out of the west into the parts of the northern plains, Midwest, Great Lakes, Canadian Maritimes. You know, this is all coming from uh, the, the initiation of these new fires here throughout the western United States. Okay, when it comes to precip, this is what the last seven days look like. And we mentioned a couple of areas that were probably going to get leapfrogged as that front came through. I, it's kind of an odd term, but I think that's the best way to describe it. And I've kind of highlighted a couple of those areas. We were much drier farther to the west. Remember, this one started off with snow here in parts of Montana, a little bit in Idaho, and then right here along the Rocky Mountains as it gets on the border of, of Alberta and uh, British Columbia. But I think the, the rains that I, I've been watching most carefully to kind of fill in holes or in parts of Texas, and some of that did. I mean, we got some good moisture into this area and even some rain through the lower Mississippi River Valley in the last seven days. But if you look back over the last 30 days, that was not enough to kind of outdo uh, some of the bigger drought you know, areas that we're dealing with here. And a lot of that throughout the lower Mississippi Basin, the Ohio River Basin, part of the Mississippi, mid-Mississippi Basin, a big area in the southeast, and then we can still see the Red River Valley, these large areas that are still very, very dry. Of course, as I always say, I don't want that to distract from some other areas that have been 
um, you know, so very dry as well. These pockets throughout the Western Corn Belt too. And it's also important to note that when you go back, hopefully this will load. Let's see. Hey, it worked <laughs> over the last 14 days. Um, it's so dry down here in Georgia, South Carolina. And there were some heavy rains this past weekend and late last week in the Carolinas and the Mid-Atlantic, some local flooding, <clears throat> excuse me, as a result. But, uh, um, you know, you can see some of these pockets. It's interesting. I, I did pull up, I always mark my house. So that 165 is at my house. And I mentioned, remember we had the, the band event on Friday night. It got canceled. Watch storms build all afternoon. Thought they were going to miss us. They kind of built on their backside and absolutely drenched. So I'm yet to hear my daughter play in the marching band. I can't wait until the next event this Friday. Okay, so anyways, um, I, I want to add this to some bigger stats here. So let's go look at what the month of August through the first couple of days of September look like. And again, this area, we talked about it on Friday with the drought expansion, has been just exceptionally dry and, of course, quite hot as of late. But I think this map really just kind of tells us maybe where the pattern is settling in. And I'll be honest, I've now heard from so many more of you in this region that are like, if we could just get something weak to come out of the Gulf now, they don't want it later, of course, because that could be very problematic for harvest, especially for the cotton crop that's down here. But there's just this request for some moisture in this area, and a tropical system can sometimes do that. And to be honest, there's a lot of us that the farther we get into September, would be problematic to get that rain. But some early September rains in the eastern Corn Belt, where we still have such dry soils, and we need more rain here just to finish this crop. One last good shot at some rain in this region to kind of back off on uh, the risk of the crop finishing too dry in some places. Now, that's not to say that there isn't already quite a bit of damage. And I appreciate those of you that kind of fill me in on what these issues look like in this area. But this is a significant portion of the Mississippi Basin that has very dry soil. And when the crop is as large as it is, even when we get rains like I just showed you, it doesn't typically drain into the soil and get into the river system. The, 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 you know, the local, uh, you know, plant biomass, its root structure, the, so it holds all of it. And that's why, despite even some recent rains, the Mississippi continues to drop. And this morning at Memphis, we are now at almost six feet below low stage. And when you see this upcoming forecast, which again is quite dry for a lot of the Mississippi Basin, uh, it's going to be, um, you know, it's probably going to continue to drop further. I, I'll be honest with you, looking out longer range, I have concerns about us returning to something like this maybe not lasting as long as it did a year ago. But I do think that as we go through September, we're going to see these levels at uh, Memphis continue to drop. Now, again, we come back to that discussion about, you know, the, the, the hurricanes. And if you just take a look, oh, here's a better view of what I was explaining to you. That's where the high pressure is this morning. Can you kind of see how the flow is coming out and around like this? And uh, that's, you know, this was right in that area we were keeping a close eye on. But we know this, we got lows dropping into the, um, you know, into the uh, Gulf of Alaska, excuse me. And that's actually going to be much more dominant on our pattern than I think any risk of tropical development here. We've paid attention now for several, I mean, several weeks I've been calling for the end of August, beginning of September to get active. But there is just, uh, there's too much going on with the winds, the higher shear values in this area, and uh, the fact that we can't seem to get these waves to survive. But here they are. This is this morning's data. 40% chance on a disturbance coming out of the Caribbean. Too, way too windy in here. The following wave on the back side. Uh, they don't, apparently that link must, must be broken, but it's below 40% chance. And then finally, we have another system coming here. But I think a lot of folks are just watching animations like this. The Bermuda High is in place. It's doing its thing. But right here in the Gulf, remember, we, we've had this kind of story that the Gulf is ready if it gets a system in it that can that can go and some of the forecast on some of members from the european are attempting to take this and just pull it north along the gulf shore at some point now i'm going to tell you even though i say that you have to understand that the uncertainty is still very very high how this weak wave which is moving across a highly sheared caribbean interacts with the yucatan peninsula and then what it does in this you know the bay of campeche are getting up here in the gulf but it's there it could you know, very easily develop into a system that we need to be paying attention to. So you'll see it in the upper level height field uh, as well. But I think the more dominant factor for nearly everyone listening to me today is going to be what happens with these troughs that keep developing uh, around Alaska and into the Gulf of Alaska. So you just saw me play through the, uh, you know, the end of this week. 
and we have a weak disturbance. I'll just take you back right here. I've got to keep an eye on this guy. I'll show you what it's going to do in a few moments. But it traverses right over the top of Montana. It joins up with a broader trough here. But I don't think we're going to have enough moisture as this one comes through to deliver a lot of rain. It's going to be kind of starved for moisture. But this is by Friday. And as that trough digs into the Great Lakes, you know, we're going to get some cool air to follow this. What prevented it from being really cold was that this ridge didn't extend farther into Alaska. But I'll show you these temps on this one in just a few moments here for this first week of September. We play this forward out to next Monday and Tuesday. Of course, what follows it as another deep trough develops is an opening up to quite a bit of heat. This would be out there about a week from now. And then we just play this out and what do you notice? Something trying to get going down here. Almost, you know, this is nine days away from where we are. And I'll just make a quick statement about what we often have to look for meteorologically with this. If you're going to get a tropical system out of the Gulf of Mexico to hit the coast, this is one thing you need. You need the big west coast trough. Because if you have that, you end up getting um, a ridge that develops here. And in the low levels, this is creating a circulation that's helping to promote the movement of a tropical system into uh, you know, the, the Gulf Coast of the United States. So honestly, watch for West Coast troughs if there is an approaching tropical system. I don't care if it's from the Gulf, the Caribbean, or the Western Atlantic. West Coast troughs are typical, you know, the typical setup to getting that to occur. Now, West Coast trough also means cool weather coming in here and more unsettled weather. But that's that's all the way out there on September 11th. Beyond this, the 12th, 13th, 14th, this is just the artificial intelligence, what it's doing with that low. Remember, this is just one solution. That's why we looked at the ensemble a few moments ago. We'll keep an eye on that as we look out over the next 10 days. But um, I think the most important thing that I see here is that the pattern keeps wanting to go back to these deeper lows here. Um, I still think we have a cooler signal at times in the midsection of the country. But making a big call on a on an early frost event through halfway through September, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that yet. Okay, so with all of that, sorry if that was a bit scattered, let's get into some of the forecast information. Um, Storm Prediction Center, just uh, the new maps that I'm creating. Um, this is the day one convective outlook. So where we currently have the wave moving through, we're going to keep an eye on Oregon, Idaho, and uh, parts of Nevada. This would be day two, opening up to a much broader area here. Uh, in the Intermountain West, getting into Montana, Wyoming. And then you've got day three where this is starting to spread and make a much larger area in the Northern Plains. But as we look at the precip, kind of blow this up so you can see it here. This is uh, the high res NAM simulation for today. So we're about here. As we play this forward, a lot of scattered rain still in Texas, some thunderstorms in there as well. We then play this out to this evening, isolated storms. You can see them right in through this area to keep an eye on. Still more showers right in central Texas, some down here in the southeast as well. So this is overnight tonight, getting into early Wednesday morning, playing through Wednesday midday in the afternoon. And you see that low coming out right in through here, delivering another chance at getting some rainfall in this area. Now the NAM is attempting to get something just to curl up here as a weak, like almost looks like a tropical low just off the coast. And if we go back to the National Hurricane Center, they were watching that. They actually had a, you know, like a, oh, they're updated. A temp, they had a 10% chance on something here uh, in some of their recent forecasts. Maybe it was in the two-day. Uh, no, I don't know. But um, we'll need to keep a close eye on that uh, going forward because locally we get some pretty heavy rain out of it. So here are some of my new maps. They're all going to be the same projection. They're all going to have the same kind of numbers laid over them. And then I also have these regionally, not only here, but around the world. You just won't have access to those just yet until I finish the site. So this is the WPC seven day. And a lot of you ask me, well, why don't we get more data out of some of your models farther? Well, I actually make the map so you can see the edge of the domain. That is the only area over which the WPC forecasts. So I know a lot of you in Canada would love to see more of this, but uh, this is what I've got. So that's WPC seven day. This is the national blend of models. Can you see it's got a very similar um, projection area. This is uh, the seven day for the WPC. This is the, forgive me, that's the seven day NBM, 10 day NBM. Very wet down here. So there is something that needs to be watched coming in this direction. We can see some of these numbers down here are quite high. Now what'll be nice is you'll be able to do this very soon with my website, we can just say, well, show me the Southeastern United States. 
and that's the 10 day on the southeast. So there is the potential here for quite a bit of precipitation. And clearly something is wrong with this. <laughs> See, this is my frustration. I don't know what these numbers are. These are not right. So we'll get those fixed. I apologize. What did I do? Maybe I left them in millimeter. I don't know. Or meters. Who knows? Uh, this is right. I, I know. I, I know this one's right. And I want your opinion on this as well. This is my um, seven-day GFS forecast. And I tried to make everything over an inch in, in yellow. I thought it was just easier to have it jump out there at you. Let's see if this one works properly. So southeast. Hey, oh, that works. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I got no sleep last night and um, the dumb website's frustrating. I'm just trying to turn the frustration at least into something funny here. Uh, but anyways, that's your, uh, that's your seven day from the uh, GFS. Let's go back to the broader view. There it is. And here's the 10. Now, if you notice something, even with the disturbance that's coming through here, we're not looking at a lot of precipitation out of this, right? The one you just saw in the NAM, just want to make that clear here, uh, but very potentially very wet across the uh, across the Gulf Coast states. So finally, the European, that's the seven day European. And here is the 10 day. Okay, now I want your opinion on this as well. Oh, I got the AIFS, seven day AI, AIFS and 10 day AIFS. So we have to be watching the tropics. That's the long story short here. Okay, here's what I want your opinion on. These are my new precip type maps. So type and intensity. And if you remember, they, um, I don't know, between the European and the GFS, they weren't very consistent, right? But I hope you like the new color scheme on this. And of course, when there is snow, you'll, you'll see it. It'll show up as blue as well. And the ice will show up as black. So that was a quick 10 day look, but you'll notice through you know the rest of the day today getting into wednesday there's the chances for storms coming out of the plains you can just see the wet weather along the gulf coast here that low curls up over the great lakes that's the deeper trough this friday this is where the high pressure comes in behind this really cooling things off this weekend you'll see that in a few moments that low then deepens right here over the great lakes and that's where i'm concerned you know, this Saturday night, Sunday morning to getting some really chilly air into this region. If the winds stay up behind this, then the risk of the frost is down. But as it stands, I think we're going to see some temperatures down here in the 30s. I don't, uh, you'll see my frost map in a minute, but I'm, I'm concerned about that. So then as we play this forward, you can see the front was clearing the East Coast. And then by next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, a lot of focus is going to go into the tropics and the next deep low that kind of rolls out right here. Now, you'll notice that my new GFS has the same color scheme, everything. So this is something I've wanted to work on for a while. So let's just play through it so you can see it. This is the GFS. There's the same front clearing by this Friday. Low curling up. Look at that. There's some snow possibly in the GFS there. This is now getting through the weekend into early next week. There's the next deep low that comes out. And again, we'll be watching anything in the tropics. But by the way, if you like, the GFS goes way out there. It goes out 360 hours. So feel free to play around with this once I get the new site uh, completely functioning for you. And I'll do the blend. I'll put them together so you can get the composite soon. All right, but here's the big story. Over the next 10 days, this is who's going to be on the drier side of it. This is the chance of staying under a tenth of an inch. So while there will be storms coming through this area, there's a lot of you know, real estate in this region that has, it's going to miss this. Okay. So the next three days, we're going to see storms, but most of this region is going to be drier on the wetter side of it. I think, you know what this is going to, yeah, it's just all down here. And then out of Ontario to Quebec, that's where our wettest conditions are likely going to be over the next 10 days. So what about week two? Well, on the new site, which I may monkey around with this, you're now going to be able to see the CPC, the European ensemble, the European Artificial Intelligence, and the GFS. So here they all are. This is the week two forecast. And uh, I wanted to look at some of them kind of uh, individually here. So if we take a look at the you know European day eight through 14, much drier in the interior, but we're wetter in the west and we're wet across the southeast. Those are our two areas that are gonna stay wet. And you can see the similarities here. By the way, the AI with that second system, uh, that tropical system, Remember, this is not an ensemble, it's just one. It's trying to pull all of that moisture into this region. That's just one model though. One model, we have to be very careful with that as we try to assess this. All right, let's get on and talk about temperatures. Frost, over the next seven days, possibly some patchy frost in the UP, maybe lower Michigan. And this was this morning, what we were worried about. 
let me show you these temperatures. Uh, nope, not here. Well, this is how you might be able to use it. You'd be able to come in and click on max temperatures and do this, but I'm still monkeying around with this. I don't know if you guys will even like this. But you're like, oh, let me see the temperatures. You can just slide through them. <sighs> I don't know, but let's let's look here. Here's max temperatures for today. This is Wednesday, Thursday. Now watch the cold air dive in the midsection of the country while the west goes extremely hot. 101 back here uh, in the Willamette Valley. These are highs on Friday. 60s and 70s. 60s and 70s down here. Oh, look at that. Do you see that? Whew. So then this is behind the low. So if you remember, the low is here. Big ridge builds into the west. This is when I was telling you this cool air is going to come through. We're looking at highs on Saturday, um, maybe in parts of Wisconsin and Michigan, not getting out of the 50s. And then this is Sunday and Monday, and then it opens back up to more warmth. But Saturday morning, this is the current NDFD forecast. And this is where we start to get some concerns. You start to get this colder air in place. We know at higher elevations farther west, we always have the risk of frost. This is Sunday morning. Um, so I, I just think we're going to have to be on the lookout for some colder, the risk of getting into the thirties. I will watch this all week. You, you please keep up with me on this, uh, as we go forward. Um, beyond that, well, that is ugly. Let's zoom back out. Sorry, I'm getting this fixed. You now will have access to the ECMWF ensemble and the GFS ensemble for five day chunks like we normally do. And you can slide down here and see the temperature forecast from the CPC as well. Um, I just don't like it because you can't see it very clearly in this, right? If the maps are too small. Uh, but next five days, that's these maps. Here's day five through 10, and this is day 10 through 15. So what you notice is that after that cool air I just mentioned clears out, a lot of warmth spreads back in. In fact, the models day five through 10 are really much above average in the uh, central part of the Canadian prairie. So quite important, I think, to see that for going forward. All right, where are we going to finish this one? Uh, we did get new data from the CPC for mid-September, and everything about this makes sense to me. If you remember, we talked about La Nina coming and starting to get more of an influence. That means near normal temperatures west, a lot of warmth for mid-September in the midsection of the country. We tend to be wetter earlier in the northwest and we're still watching tropical systems here but drier in this area so this is a this is a very la nina mid to late september outlook from the cpc uh, and that look at this we've just seen a nice resurgence of trade winds cool the water beginning it up well look at these beautiful waves that it forms as it comes to the surface and uh, we know that right now those ocean temperatures let's see here there we go are um we're almost down to minus 0.55 at this point. So this is this is really beginning to show up. The current Southern Oscillation Index is now at 8. Remember, the threshold for La Nina-like behavior is 7. Whoops, 7 would be up here. And uh, so this is, this is we're starting to get this. And even the forecast shows, look at this area in through here. We're getting, those blues represent stronger trade winds. So this is very much La Nina-esque in its forecast, or La Nina-like. And I think that's why the newest update for one month looks just La Nina to the T. So what is it? We tend to be a bit cooler on the coasts here uh, and here with much more warmth in the interior. We tend to have a lot of tropical systems, so this is expected, but drier in the interior. First showing up of wet would be uh, in the northwest. I like this. This is exactly what would play out if the La Nina begins to take over, and maybe it is right now. What will be important to see is what it does to South America. So over the next 10 days in South America, there are some wetter conditions, Paraguay, Uruguay, southern Brazil, pockets of Argentina, but the monsoon is not yet going at all. And we're just waiting on these winds to, you know, they, they've got to come up and around like this. But do you, do you notice how some of the flow is doing that? So it's missing drawing in good moisture. This is pulling from a dry area. See this? This isn't getting tropical moisture into place. And remember, the subtropics down here are dry. But the newest updates from the European model continue to show this. Not an early arrival of the monsoon in September, but as we get out there and just play the 30-day sliding window, the beginning of October, 
starts to show wet here. And the European model has been the model that's been forecasting this for a while. So we'll see if this actually does take shape. You say, well, what would La Nina do? I mean, maybe better chances of rain here early, drier down south. And remember, our biggest concern down here is that they are going to need just-in-time rains to make sure that this crop gets going and gets going well because the subsoil moisture is so bad. Okay, one more apology for being a bit scatterbrained today. I just need some more rest. need to get this website fixed so that it's functioning for everybody. But I'm going to stop here to say thank you, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.